Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is, well, now it's a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything dealing with the Beatles. It could be about their music, their history, the future, whatever we feel like talking about. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for a number of other Beatle programs that I host or co-host, a syndicated Beatles radio program called Baby Little Thing, and also a brand new talk show video podcast called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts of this show. First of all, a man who has been a regular fixture now for 35 years on New York radio at uh, WFUV FM, and that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Howdy. How are you? And how is everyone out there in podcast land? <laughs> I'm sure they're fine, and, we, and it's a growing audience, I'm happy to say. And uh, along with that, we have our resident musicologist who's authored uh, a number of Beatle books, one called Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and also the Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop for many years, and even still, he's writing for Beatle Fan Magazine. He was also writing for the Classical Department at the New York Times, and now he's a freelance writer who writes for everyone and that's <laughs> that's our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to do a continuation of the new John Lennon releases, all tied in with uh, John's classic album, Imagine. Uh, we talked about the recent box set that came out uh, October the 5th, the ultimate uh, uh, collection on our last show and on today's show we're going to be talking about a couple of other releases tied in with imagine one of which is a uh, a dual uh release dvd and blu-ray of uh the imagine documentary film and give me some truth and also a brand new i guess you would call it coffee table size book which is called imagine john yoko which alan talked about a bit uh on the last show but we'll go more into detail and share our thoughts on that but before we do as we try to do in all of our shows and also since the show is once every two weeks we can accumulate a bit of news more news than we normally do so i thought that we would highlight a few things on the show this time out and uh the big news will be about paul mccartney's new remasters which we'll talk about in just a few moments uh the few items that i have first of all it happened on October the 9th, and that is that Paul McCartney gave a concert that wasn't on his itinerary, and it happened to be in Foxborough, Massachusetts. He was at Gillette Stadium, and uh, Robert Kraft, who owns the New England Patriots, booked Paul to play in a tent in which uh, it held up to 300 people. Talk about an intimate concert. And uh, this is all part of the annual fall concerts that the Crafts have. Uh, and they've been hosting it for years. There have been artists in the past like John Bon Jovi and Elton John that have performed for the Crafts and their friends. So some very lucky people got to see Paul at uh, Gillette Stadium a few weeks ago. Either of you want to comment on that? Well, my comment actually would come from the angle of a fan of the New York Jets. And as somebody who is, uh, let me be polite about this, dislikes the Patriots, I did not know that uh, uh, Robert Kraft did this every year. I saw something about it and thought, nice. So Paul McCartney is being swayed to be a Patriots fan now. But uh, no, uh, that's a, a cool gig for people to get to see Paul. You know, we've all, I think, had at least one opportunity to see him in a small venue you know, doing a special gig. So anyone who hadn't had that opportunity who was at Gillette Stadium had a nice little treat there. Mm. So, J-E-T-S. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've all been fortunate to see Paul in intimate settings between the three of us. So. And, it's and you know, and it's, it's, it's uh, something you'll remember for the rest of your life. Uh, I definitely do. <laughs> the mean fiddler for me, I mean... That was probably, well, I always say when I saw the Wings Over America tour, that was my favorite concert of all time. But to see him packed 
in a little club like that where you could barely move. You stood in the same spot for two hours straight, and you're only maybe 15 to 20 feet away from Paul on the stage. Mm -hmm. That was really something special. And mine was uh, the Highline Ballroom mm -hmm. uh, in New York City uh, around the time of Memory Almost Full. Okay. I, I was at that, too. Ah. Hmm. That was, and that, was, that was something special. And, um, Alan, I think you said that you were at, because I was at it, too, the, um, the shows at the Ed Sullivan Theater. Right. So the, uh, Paul McCartney's Close Up. Was it Close Up? Yeah. Right. For Off the Ground? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw him at the, uh, what's it called? can't remember. Lone Star Roundhouse or something, Lone Star Roadhouse, okay. right? Um, and uh, but there, I mean, he only it was a you know Buddy Holly thing, and he only got up and sang a couple of songs. But I was in the front table, so I was like ten feet from him. And uh, the Cavern, the nineteen ninety nine Cavern show. So yeah, and I, like I, I think I've said it here before that I think his small shows are really in a lot of ways the best. You don't get all the flashy staging and the explosions during Live and Let Die and all that stuff, but it's him on stage in a band playing. That's all I need to see. You know, mm. I, don't, I don't need to see the giant screens and the fireworks and all that stuff. So, uh, and I just feel, I feel almost as if, you know, just playing in a band on stage just f must feel different to him because it, it just comes off better for me anyway. Uh huh. I've seen him in big places too. I mean, those are fun, but, you know, so I'm at Yankee Stadium where I think the, these are where Darren, his true feelings about sports come out when he's at Yankee <laughs> Stadium. <laughs> well, <Which>. yes. <laughs> I saw him. The funny story was I had uh, I, I was at uh, City. He played Yankee Stadium twice. Uh, I forget what year it was. And um, I had to go to and this is the only time you'll ever hear me say, why do I have to go to the Mets, see the Mets at City Field when I could be at Yankee Stadium? <laughs> seeing Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a, a WFUV event. Uh, where I was to sit and watch the Met game with some of the radio station's um, big gift givers. Uh, this was part of a, a, an auction thing, and uh, people actually bid to go to this particular game with me and my wife, and we'd sit, and there were nice seats all arranged, and the people who bid never showed up. <laughs> which was, which was, and I'm sitting there. I mean, granted, they were great seats. My wife and I were sitting at the Met game, and I'm complaining. I could be at Yankee Stadium. McCartney's playing at Yankee Stadium. And finally, my wife said, can you please be quiet? <laughs> Aren't you happy to be with me here? I'm like, that, 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 that was not my point. But I was at Yankee Stadium the <laughs> second night mm -hmm. in, my ha in my Mets hazmat suit uh, at Yankee <laughs> Stadium. And uh, that was a great, great night, uh, McCartney playing there. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. enough well, of sports. <laughs> Just I want to say this real quickly because... I did go to the first show at Yankee Stadium with Paul, which for me will always be one of the most memorable ones because doing a Beatles program on the radio for so many years, you know what the set list is during the tour. And so you're never surprised when you go there unless, you know, he, he swaps songs around, which he has done from time to time. But the show at Yankee Stadium, that first show was the first show of the tour. So I didn't know what he was going to play. So it made it very special just oh, for cool. reason alone. So, you yeah, know, yeah. Anyway, other news. You may have noticed that a number of new videos have popped up online for a Come On To Me. Mm -hmm. And as of last count, I saw that there were three new videos, all showing people dancing and making sexy moves to the song. And that's because Paul has been challenging fans to uh, make their own video and posting it on Instagram or Twitter using the hashtag COTM challenge. And Paul is saying that he and his team will be reposting their favorites. So you can share your video and challenge your family and friends to join in. And I know that Darren is secretly planning on making a video for this. So yes, I, I, absolutely. And I was <laughs> hoping that maybe what we could do is have a things we said today where Alan and uh, me and, and you can, 
could uh, gyrate as well. Unfortunately, I know I can't speak for the two of you. I know I'd end up in, in the emergency room in traction if I tried. So, uh, no, in all seriousness, Paul's going to have to move on without my uh, input here. Uh, you don't want me gyrating to come on to me. I do like the, um, the little video that's uh, out there now of McCartney kind of miming to the song and doing his own little gyrations there. Mm -hmm. And it got a big kick out of that. And I'm looking at it going, more power to him. He's uh, 76 years old. And there's like still the enthusiasm of a, you know, of a 20 year old there. So, yeah, yeah, he's having fun in life. Yeah, so, a couple cover versions you might want to know about Barbra Streisand's upcoming album Walls includes a medley of John's Imagine, coupled with Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World, mm -hmm. and that comes out November the 2nd. And uh, Alan was the first one, I know he was so anxious to let me know that the Monkees have a new Christmas album which they just released called Christmas Party. And they are covering Paul McCartney's Christmas classic, Wonderful Christmas Time. And all, right. uh, all the Monkees fans are aware of the fact that their big comeback album from two years ago called Good Times, they have some of the, the same major players involved with this album, like uh, Rivers Cuomo, Adam Schlesinger, uh, Andy Partridge, those people. And that album's already been released. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Okay. Also, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Mary Hopkin has just re-recorded a new version of Those Were the Days. Oh, is and it finally available? I heard she was doing that. Yeah, it's available on her website. Nice. And uh, you can actually listen to it on her website, maryhopkin.com. And uh, if you listen, you will be amazed at how her voice really has not changed a bit. It's pretty close to what oh, wow. it sounded like 50 years ago. So. And and also, something we didn't talk about before we began uh, recording this show, uh, I don't know the exact date, but I think we're right around the time of uh, the release of Yoko Ono's new album, War Zone. It's Are out. We not? It's it out. Is yeah, out. It's out. Okay. It came out the other day. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And that has so. a cover of Imagine. Well, I don't know if you call it a cover, really, because she now officially co-wrote it, but I don't mm -hmm. think she's recorded Imagine before. No, and it's at the end of the album, yeah, and yeah. it's... Uh, so that's out. Okay. Mm hmm And Darren had mentioned in our last show, just very briefly, about the, um, there's a 12-inch picture disc coming out for the Traveling Wilbury's first album. And that's in celebration of its 30th anniversary. And that's coming out November the 2nd. And then we have the big news of the past week about Paul's new remasters. For Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway, we heard about this for a while, wasn't we didn't know for sure if it was definite, but it is coming out on December the 7th. Both albums will be given deluxe treatments. For Wildlife, you'll be getting, uh, let's see, well, there's the album itself remastered, a CD of rough mixes. There's also a CD of bonus material of home recordings. And um, also, uh, let's see, well, the single for Give Ireland Back to the Irish is on there, the instrumental version of that song, which is on the B-side, is on there. A few unreleased songs, like Indeed I Do, which has been bootlegged. A single edit for Love is Strained is on there. A song I'm not familiar with, African Yeah Yeah. I don't know if either of you know that song. No. But that's on a uh, third disc. And then there's a, a DVD with bonus video. Uh, one track is called Scotland, 1971. Another called The Ball. A third one, ICA Rehearsals. And then a fourth one, a rehearsal for Give Rowling Back to the Irish. And then, that's all in the um, deluxe box set. For Red Rose Speedway, you've got a remaster of the first album. And then the second CD is actually a double album. It's what Red Rose Speedway was originally proposed to be. Ah, great. So uh, all the material that was going to be originally on the, the, two, the two album set is on the second CD. Plus, uh, you know, there, there are certain songs that have been bootlegged through the years. The, uh, I call it a great cover of the song Tragedy, which was a hit for uh, the Fleetwoods and also Thomas Wayne. Really love the arrangement of that song from Wings. There's Denny Lane's song called I Would Only Smile, which he has released. 
Um, other songs like Mama's Little Girl, which comes from that period. Best Friend, which was part of the Cold Cuts release, live recording. Um, the Mess is on there. Uh, so uh, that's the second disc. Then there's a third disc of bonus audio with songs that were released around that same time of singles like Mary Had a Little Lamb and Hi, Hi, Hi and Sea Moon and Live and Let Die. There's early mixes of songs that were on, uh, on Red Rose Speedway like Little Lamb Dragonfly, Get on the Right Thing, a home recording of 1882, which is an instrumental that Henry McCullough wrote. Uh, the Mess is on there. Thank You, Darwin. Uh, another unreleased song. Live recording of 1882. There's two recordings of, actually, that makes three recordings of 1882 on this disc. Uh, there's one called Jazz Street. Um, and there's another recording of Live and Let Die. It says Group Only, Take 10. Plus, there's a DVD. And I think you'll love this. This is bonus video. There's music videos from that time. The James Paul McCartney TV special is on this DVD. Yay. Plus, there's the, a live recording in Liverpool of Live and Let Die and an interview with the band in Newcastle. Then there's also a second DVD and something which I've heard about for so many years. And now we're finally going to get to see it. Something called the Bruce McMouse Show. You guys know what this is all about? Uh -huh. It's basically sort of. a, a live recording where he decided that it might be boring to have a live recording, so he has a cartoon mouse family interspersed between the live tracks. Right. And this mouse family lives underneath the stage uh -huh. while Wings is doing a concert. Yeah. And ironically, one of the, the, the mouse's names is Soily. <laughs> ah, okay. You didn't know that? <laughs> I, no, I didn't know that. Okay, so, um, yeah. And then the other bit of news, and this is what's gotten a lot of uh, fans upset, is that there is one version that is a bundle of the two deluxe box sets with an extra disc on there. It's a CD, it's all live recordings of Wings, from 1972, various selections in different locations. And the only way, this is as far as what I've heard, the only way to get this, the whole bundle, with that extra CD, is through Paul's own website. And the list price is $399 for the two of them packaged together with that extra CD. And with so, tax and so, shipping, it comes to 431 well, in the words of Ralph Crampton, <laughs> a mere bag of shells. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can it core apple? Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> so, and the, let me see if I get this straight. The big mega box, which has the two bo boxes within boxes, are now the new trend. Right. Uh, the big mega box is only available from McCartney's website. The bundle with that one CD is only available. Okay. And, and is and this the set that's got the very colorful artwork right. right yeah yeah in fairness it's the one cd plus a book of linda's pictures from that period plus a reproduction of the 1972 tour program and i think some other european tour memorabilia so while from my point of view of course the actual recordings are the main thing you are getting some extra doodads right <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to talk more at length about this um, around the time of its release. Right. Okay. So we certainly have a lot to talk about <laughs> in the meantime with all the releases that have been taking place since Egypt Station. But we're going to continue right now with our discussion on the John Lennon releases tied into his Imagine album. So I thought we'd talk about the new uh, release of, well, it's the Imagine documentary coupled with the Give Me Some Truth video, yeah. which came out in 1999. Now, um, Alan, why don't we get your take on that? Because Darren and I actually got to see a yeah, um, yeah, special lucky. presentation. Yeah, in New York City, we got to see Imagine in a small theater in 5.1 sound, nice. which is great since, since I don't have a 5.1 system, but it was great to hear it oh. there. Well, Ken, you really should get 5.1 before the White Album 
comes out because the surround mix of that is has some really incredible stuff on it. Even things that I had previously considered as relatively trivial as why don't we do it in the road. You listen to that in 5.1 and it is all around you and it just sounds incredible. Helter Skelter mm. 2, by the way. But I digress. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, imagine. I wouldn't call Imagine a documentary exactly. It's um, it's <clears throat> basically a video album, and uh, okay. I, uh, you know, it's been out before. Uh, it was out on Laserdisc. It was out on VHS, and I guess Beta. Uh, way way back, and when Yoko put it out in those days. I guess she felt that it needed a trim and she cut some of her own songs out of it and also trimmed down the intro to imagine where they're walking through the, you know, misty grounds, grounds outside of Tittenhurst Park. And, 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 and she had sort of cut that down a bit. And I think, you know, this is now the complete original one and her songs are restored and i think they work really well in the context of this film um for one thing they're actually really interesting and um, i know this will annoy at least one person who commented on uh the youtube edition of of this show saying he will never buy anything that will give Yoko money for any of John's stuff, which is, from my point of view, a completely insane position to take. Um, <laughs> but, you know, also, it just it just works. I mean, this is the music that both of them were making at the time. She, you know, it, it's the whole Imagine album and only, like, maybe three songs of hers. Uh, and they're really interesting sort of electronic um, experimental pieces. And they're fun to watch, too. Um, I thought the the video quality was incredible um, mm -hmm. on the Imagine film. Loved hearing it. Uh, you know, also it sounded so much better than it originally had. I mean, when it came out on Laserdisc and videotape, uh, you know, it was was okay sound. I mean, the Laserdisc was good stereo sound. This is now 5.1 and uh, the new mixes. And uh, it was just, a, it, was, it really was exciting to watch, I, I felt, after all those years. I hadn't really, I hadn't watched the old editions for a while, partly because it bothered me that those cuts had been made, you know. And I had the full thing on bootleg, but really the quality was, I mean, it was okay, it wasn't great. Uh, Give Me Some Truth is, of course, made of outtakes from those, from the Imagine film. Clearly, when they were doing the Imagine film, they had the idea that they were going to put together a companion album, and so they filmed tons and tons of stuff, some of which is the sessions, some of which is John and Yoko doing interesting things out on the grounds or elsewhere, uh, in some cases, I think, in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, in one case, in Connecticut, Ken. Uh, <laughs> Really? It, was it in Connecticut or it might have been on the island? I don't know. It was, it was at a party of Alan Klein, so maybe it was Long Island. Oh, hmm. I'm not sure where that was. Yeah, <laughs> which, you know, where you see John just chatting away with Miles Davis. You know, nice shot. Um, mm -hmm. So, and Give Me Some Truth is basically put together from the outtakes of that, and uh, it's also really interesting and, uh, you know, shows the album being made, which the Imagine film doesn't really. The Imagine film is just a video companion to the finished mixes of Imagine. This shows them in the studio putting it together, and uh, and I think it has pretty much every song on the album, doesn't it? I saw it once in a public showing, uh, not, you know, this time and not in 5.1, but it was at Pace University uh, in maybe 2002 when uh, I did a public interview with Yoko uh, as part of a New York Times Arts Weekend thing. And before the interview, they showed the film. And it was which film, Alan? Are you talking uh, give about? Me, give me some truth. Give me some truth. Okay. Yeah, and it was really you know pretty packed, and the and the interview was with Yoko and uh, Andrew Salt, who produced the Give Me Some Truth film, and he also produced Imagine John Lennon. That one mm. I would call a documentary. 
So mm-hmm. not to be confused, <laughs> imagine John Lennon was the one that came out in 88, um, around the same time as the dreaded Goldman book. And, you know, had Andrew Salt got lots and lots of interesting footage for it. And I think that was around when he bought the Ed Sullivan archive shortly after that. But he also got to use all of this Imagine filming footage. And this became a second project, Give Me Some Truth. And the one thing I remember of the the showing uh, was there was a scene in there where John and the group are working through one of the songs and they keep stopping and Yoko is sitting there and John is asking her, you know, what it is that's bothering her about the takes so far. And, you know, she's whispering to him because she's not sort of announcing her opinion in front of the whole group. She's just telling John what she thinks. And she says, they're improvising. And John says, okay, no improvising. And for some reason, you know, that cracked the audience up, you know, it was, um, and, uh, and then she came out and did the interview, which was uh, a lot of fun. Um, I'm not sure if she actually watched the film, uh, at the, at that point, but, but yeah, you know, the two of them are, 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 are great together and it's great having them in a single package because they really do belong together. Mm-hmm. So that's basically, I guess what I have to say about it. It's funny you mentioned that about what Yoko said to John in the studio there, because we're going to talk about the Imagine John and Yoko book, but when you read what a lot of the musicians and the creative people around the album had to say about working on Imagine, they will tell you that Yoko was very involved in the creative process of the album, right. making suggestions to John a lot. Yeah, And John, John gives her credit, too, mm-hmm. in various ways, too. Darren, what are your thoughts? Uh, ditto. Basically, to everything Alan just said, he really uh, hit the nail on the head perfectly, I think, in in describing the release as it being, uh, you know, a really handy catch-all, getting these two films together, uh, two films cut from the same cloth but different uh, in the finished product. I was not, if I was, I, I hesitate to say I was not aware of the edits to the imagined film. Mm-hmm. I probably knew at some point that they had that the movie had been trimmed, but forgot over time. And then when uh, the initial announcement started coming out of all of these Imagine releases, the audio, the box set, uh, the book, which we're going to mention in a little bit, and the movies, I found myself getting a little confused over what you know what the the uh, video portion, the DVD and Blu-ray were going to be, and then Ken and I got to see. The screening that we saw was specifically just the imagined film. And then it all sort of all fell back into place. And I'm like, I remember this now. I have this on VHS. And it's terrific to see it restored because footage, if I'm not mistaken, footage like that party scene where you do see uh, uh, Miles Davis, that was cut from, I'm pretty sure that was just one of the scenes cut from what was available back this would have been in the eighties, I guess. Late 80s, right, the VHS yeah. mm-hmm. and the and the laser disc, and it also made me realize how many years had passed since I'd put that uh, VHS tape in my player and watched it. Uh, it was kind of like seeing it again for the first. It was like seeing it a, a, for the first time, and really get the five point one mix is just really what draws you in because you're getting you're hearing. You know, you really, for, for me, it was the first time I was really getting all of these imagined songs in this surround uh, environment. Uh, and I do, I also like the fact that the Yoko songs are included. Fly is a very interesting album. And if you, you're really, it's, 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 it's a period where I think the two of them, John and Yoko, are working together, as you pointed out, Alan. Really, the only time until Double Fantasy that I think they worked together really well you know plastic ono band yeah yoko had got came out of that with an album but that was more i always thought that that was more of yoko just being around the sessions you know and letting herself go during you know during downtime during mm-hmm. jams uh whereas some and and sometime in new york city was a nice idea on paper but maybe the finished product didn't work during that period, 1971, 
when John was recording Imagine, and some people may not be aware of the fact that Yoko was recording Fly at the same time, you know, and you do see the two albums merge together somewhat in the Imagine film. So that makes it a must have. And uh, Fly was a double album, so there's a lot of stuff that didn't make the film. Um, they mm -hmm. they really wanted to make it a very very long film. They could have done more sequences uh, with more of Yoko's songs because Fly was a double. You know, it's an early. The Imagine film itself is sort of a uh, a compilation of early music videos pre MTV in a way. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it like that, the original Imagine film a collection of, of music videos that kind of explains it. And then give me some truth allows you to sink your teeth into how the making of John's imagine album. But again, I'm a little curious, uh, if there was, if there's anything, anything else out there fly oriented, I'd be curious to see, but Alan's summarization is, is basically, that's it. That's, that's the DVD and or Blu-ray in a nutshell. Mm hmm. Well, I kind of agree with most of what the two of you have said. I, I really enjoy both films for different reasons. And I do kind of feel like you said, Darren, that this is like every song has its own video. And, you know, you can just take one particular song, watch it as it's playing and what's on the screen for that time. And it can stand as a video by itself. Kind of like even though Beatles movies are great as movies, you know that in the MTV era, they took apart the song sequences and made videos for themselves and they stand as videos mm -hmm. for the films. So it's kind of like that for me when I'm watching Imagine. It's nice to know that this is what accompanied Jealous Guy. This is what accompanied Oh My Love. You know, you can you can see what what you might interpret as a video for that song. At the same time, seeing it in the theater, I've never seen a picture as crisp of Imagine as I just did. It was the best print I've ever seen of it. And the audio blew me away. Mm -hmm. It really did. I mean, to hear How Do You Sleep in a small theater in 5.1 and to hear the strings the way they were. And certain songs had so much more bite than they ever have, like How Do You Sleep. Or um, I felt that way with It's So Hard and, and Crippled Inside. It's just the best sound I ever heard of, of the songs from, from the Imagine album. So, uh, yeah, I, I was very much impressed with the work that was done there. And I do like the fact that um, that they put a few Yoko songs in there. I think probably if they tried to make it more a 50-50 collaboration, like Sometime in New York City or Double Fantasy, there would there would have been a bit more resistance to, to the film. Sure. Uh, yeah, But sure. um, I think they only had about four of Yoko songs in there. And they were, uh, I would say some of the more recognizable of uh, Yoko songs like Midsummer New York or Mrs. Lennon. There were a few moments in the film personally that I felt dragged a bit, especially the scene where John and Yoko are, are playing chess and, you know, and, and they're, John is swallowing the chess pieces, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. It went on a little bit too long there for me. And what also, song was that again? That was Yoko's song. I think that was Don't Count the Waves. Okay if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and then there was gosh. also the um, the scene in the hotel where Yoko opens the door and Fred Astaire comes in and then George Harrison comes in. And yeah. it's, it's just done so many times. It's like, yeah. okay, it's cute. I like it. But, you know, it, it, was, it was done too much. It went on too long. But otherwise, there's so many really touching scenes in there that you talk about getting confused. Some of this stuff was later put into... John's videos for his singles. So much is used from the original Imagine, what did you call it, video album, Alan? Yeah. I guess that's probably a better, a better way of describing it. And also, I'm very happy that these two are coupled together. I enjoy Give Me Some Truth for the simple reason that there's nothing like watching the rehearsals of these musicians. And um, as we talked about in our last show, it was such a superb band and uh, it's just fascinating to see any of them together in the studio. And it's also great when you just have John in the vocal booth, just doing a vocal to a backing track, mm -hmm. which uh, I find to be fascinating. You get to see the different sides of John there. You can see the loving side, the humorous side, and also when he's nasty, mm -hmm. when, he, when he yells at Phil McDonald. 
during the sessions for O Yoko when he's doing a, a harmony, doing the harmonies with Phil Spector on that. And um, I also just love seeing uh, certain songs, Give Me Some Truth, I think was one of them, or How, where John's just doing the vocal take and he screws up on the vocal or it's a little hoarse and then he sticks his tongue out <laughs> as if to say, oh, well, that was a mistake there. Um, just little things like that. The, the different sides of John that you capture there. You know, there's, there's a lot of great moments uh, on Give Me Some Truth. The only criticism I would ever make of Give Me Some Truth is that where they didn't have rehearsal footage, then they relied on Imagine. Right. Uh, you know, and that happened a little bit too much. And if you watch these two films back to back, it gets repetitive. Yeah, there's, I was just going to say that could be a drawback for some people, but I think it would be, you'd be, be being picky if you, the redundancy that, that happens when you watch them side by side. Yeah. Uh, I liked what I found myself doing in watching the Imagine film. You know, when I, when, what, the Darren of the 80s when the, the tape, when the VHS came out and of today, uh, I would say, uh, I'd, <laughs> I'd like to believe I'm, um, uh, much more tuned in and much more knowledgeable. I found myself watching for the fly on the wall effect, uh -huh. trying to get see what his studio looked like and glimpses of the house and uh, oh, that's the pond, the aerial view of the pond. I had heard that that's that was man made. Hmm, interesting. And there's the eye and the house and the island. And the, I found myself looking at the, trying to get like a, a peek into the lives. Of right. John and Yoko, and with the house, especially taking into consideration the Tittenhurst Park, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, hope I'm right here. Ringo bought when mm -hmm. John and Yoko left for New York. Ringo moved in. That's right. And at that time, I think um, I remember hearing a story that Judas Priest recorded in the studio. Uh, this was when Ringo owned the house, and I don't recall what album that they recorded, but they tell the story about raiding the kitchen and needing to get sort of a, uh, a, a lightning bolt effect or something in a song. They decided to empty all the uh, drawers of all the silverware and rattle them in pans and pots uh, mm -hmm. and then have to put everything back because this was Ringo's kitchen, essentially. So when I was watching the footage, watching the imagined film, I'm like really interested in how the studio was built and fit into this space in this mansion and, you know, the other different nuances of the way John and Yoko lived in the early 70s. And what a great segue into the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But I just, I wanted to just bring up one thing because I was, I was mentioning the, the scene with Yoko with John yelling at Phil McDonald. There's right. also a scene in there when the band is rehearsing Oh My Love. And John is angry at Nicky Hopkins because in the middle of working on that, he's changing the reel to reel tapes. So, you know, John is yelling at Nicky for changing the reels in the middle of the take. So you talk about fly on the wall stuff and, yeah. you know, we're all drawn to that. But you can see, you know, the side of John and you learn so much, especially with this book that we're about to discuss, of what he was like in the studio that way. You know, the many sides of John Lennon. So... With that, why don't we talk about that new book, which is called Imagine John Yoko. Many things I'd like to say about it, but I think I'll let Darren start. I have to admit that I've only really thumbed it very quickly, and my, my observations on the book are very superficial in that it's just, it's, it, it's a treasure trove of, of, I didn't even really read the text, but I mean, the, just the photographs alone, if it were a picture book alone, it would stand stand on its own i love the way the book is also designed i am interested about this deluxe book which i can't seem to find because that's what i have attempted to purchase the deluxe edition which it has extra pages with extra material in it and i think is in a slip case but again my opinion about the book is i really haven't sunk my teeth into it is superficial but mm -hmm. just uh, I just at a quick glance, I was floored by it and can't wait to get my hands on my own copy of it. Well, I'll tell you, even if you if you have a quick glance, you'll be amazed at what you'll yeah, see. Yeah, I was. I was. And I can't, you know, uh, uh, some, it was somebody else's copy. I haven't had the opportunity to get it yet. 
Uh, and like I said, I'm still trying to figure out the deal with this deluxe edition, whether it's sold out already Sorry. or hasn't been released yet. Alan, you know more about that? Yeah, I think it comes out at the end of November because I have one on order and I got a notice saying that it was delayed until then. So the deluxe ones seem to be delayed, but the standard ones are out. I mean, the mm-hmm. standard one, and, and just looking at it without even opening it, I love the way they do the uh, the skyline along the pages. What do you? What would you? Um, what would you call that? The uh, page. Well, the, the the end of the page has a blue tint to it. Yeah. But yeah, also, right. in the middle of of the book itself, there's some white, as if to look like a cloud. Yeah, it's 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 really really well done. Yeah. And Alan? I know Alan last in the last show was raving about. You know, just don't dismiss this as a coffee table book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I review this for the Washington Post and so got it uh, a bit early and had expected it to be a coffee table book and was kind of surprised that they were asking for a review of a coffee table book. But it turns out that it has quite a lot of text. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, Everybody who was involved in the album, and that includes not just all the musicians, but all of John and Yoko's assistants and secretaries, and uh, the guy who built the studio, and then moving over to New York, some of the, they didn't get all of the string players, but they got one, Aaron Rosant, who's actually a very well-known solo violinist now and uh, the night manager of the record plant and the owners of the record. I mean, you know, basically everybody who had anything to do with this is represented. And where they were no longer alive, which um, includes several of the musicians, not the least being John and George, they cobbled together things from archival interviews, you know, as like with the anthology book. And... um, I guess, you know, where people didn't participate, they also cobbled together what they could. And so some of that is very bio-like and and not and only a few comments about the album, making the album. But it gives you a complete cast of characters and it includes photos of everybody. So that when you, if you've read this book and then you watch the Imagine movie and Give Me Some Truth... You now know everybody that you're seeing. I mean, it used to be, okay, you know, I know the musicians, that's all I need to know, and the rest are, you know, they might as well be extras. But now they all have names and faces and backstories, and I have to say, it really changes the experience of watching those two films when you know who everybody is on the screen, even if they're just darting by, even if they're just an assistant. It also explains a lot of stuff that you see in the film, like Ken mentions John blowing up at Phil McDonald. And this was because Mm. Phil McDonald couldn't find the verse in the song that John wanted to overdub. And what the book explains is that the reason he couldn't find the verse is because the studio was not complete when they started recording this album. And so every day they would spend some time on sessions and then leave it to the engineering crew to spend some time finishing the studio. And one of the things that the studio didn't have, at least at that point, were tape counters. You know, the numbers Mm -hmm. that go reeling Mm -hmm. through is... and, and, And so, you know an engineer will depend on that to find the particular verse that he's looking for. But Phil McDonald had no recourse. Um, He just had to sort of eyeball this large open reel tape. So this book sort of, you know, lets you know what's going on really in that scene. You know, John's upset and we understand why he's upset, but we now also understand why Phil McDonald couldn't just find the verse, which would seem fairly simple. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. So, so you know, a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, this book just, it the level of detail it gives you about, you know, what Darren was saying, what life in Tittenhurst was like. I mean, it even goes to the point of 
explaining that every room was carpeted in either black or white. And the white rooms were the rooms that John and Yoko and their immediate staff could go in and the black rooms anybody else could go in. And I guess that, you know, prevented people from just wandering through anywhere. It it, it just was sort of a really interesting little tidbit about what the house was like and what it was like to be there. Um, similarly, uh, when we get to the New York sessions for the overdubbing, the night manager of the record plant tells us that John didn't like sharing joints. And so part of her job was to roll <laughs> little joints for everybody in the sessions. <laughs> so Micro joints. Yeah, really. uh -huh. So I should leave some of the good stuff to you, Ken, um, because you've read it too. So, Well, you've covered quite a lot of what I would say, but um, it's kind of like what you just said. I think anybody who ever breathed at Tittenhurst Park is mentioned in this book. Mm -hmm. And some of them get a full page, and we're talking about, since this is a large book, you know, it's, it's a lot of text. Some of them... It's not as lengthy, but a lot of names that you've seen, if you look at the credits of the Imagine album, and you don't really know who they are, or what their backgrounds are, they, they tell you enough information about them. You know, people like Rod Linton, he actually first met John when he, he was in a band called Rupert's People, mm -hmm. and um, their drummer in the band, Steve Brendel, who's also on the album, worked for Apple. And uh, Rod Linton worked with a management uh, team that handled Wishbone Ash. And uh, Mal Evans asked him to bring musicians to the Imagine Sessions. Mal asked Rod to do this. So he brought along names like Ted Turner from Wishbone Ash, Andy Davis from a band called Stackridge, which some fans might know, because in the 70s, George Martin produced an album for that band. And also John Tout from Renaissance. Right. So, you know, learning little things like that, just to connect the dots. Obviously, we all love the core group of musicians that were on this album, Klaus Foreman, Nicky Hopkins, you know, Alan White, and uh, Jim Kelton was on there too, and George Harrison, of course. But um, there were so many other people that were involved, and they all get credit here in this book. Every single person that was involved with Imagine is in this book. I also, you were talking about learning about the house itself, there are maps here that oh, outline wow. the, the inside of the house, all the different rooms, and there's even a map of what's on the grounds of Tittenhurst, all the different trees they had and where they were located. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty See, incredible. That's the kind of stuff. I can't wait. I should have mentioned before that at, by the time this is heard, I will have the book because I finally did order it, gave up trying to track down the, uh, the deluxe edition first. That's the kind of details that I find fascinating. Uh, hmm. That's always been my kind of thing about, you know, like I'm like as we approach now the 50th anniversary of uh, the Beatles' appearance on the uh, on the Apple roof. For some reason, this summer I found a bunch of cool videos on online, little clips of this and that, and got very fascinated with the logistics of what, you know, not just the music, the logistics of how they pull that off. Right. I'm really looking forward to looking at the uh, layout of, of Tittenhurst. I have to ask this. Who is the attractive blonde walking around on the roof? That's of, uh, John's secretary. Castle? I can't remember. Uh, Diana Robertson. Okay. Very good. Hmm. I was what, wondering. You want her number? Oh, she was... <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, I it doesn't give the numbers, but <laughs> gives everything else. <laughs> You know, it also has um, an article, I'm calling it an article because it's like several pages long, about each of the songs with a lot of quotes from John about what he was after, sometimes contradictory quotes, which, you know, you would get from John over time. You know, for instance, mm -hmm. how do you sleep? Well, you know, he, he, he talks about how it's about Paul, how it's a response to too many people, all that stuff. But then it, later on it has a quote saying, you know, I wish I hadn't said it all being about Paul because it could be about anybody, you know. Well, actually it can't, but fine, you know. It's very specific. But there's also manuscripts, you know, his handwritten manuscripts for, I mm -hmm. guess, all the songs, if not all, then most. And he would have the, the lyrics typed out and hand them to all the musicians 
during the sessions. And so those typed versions are in the book too. And one of the things that one of the musicians said, I mean, they're just like these little tidbits buried all over the place, you know, within each person's section. And one of them said, uh, yeah, you know, John handed us out these lyrics and he said to us, I want you to read and understand these before you start playing on the track. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's, that is great. Um, it is. There's other stuff like there's um, there's this two page letter on American Airlines stationery. Uh, in fact, oh, yeah. a lot of his lyrics are on hotel stationery and you name it. And um, by the way, I should also point out that the White Album book will also have the manuscripts, the handwritten manuscripts to basically all the songs or most of them. Um, and it's similar, you know, they're on envelopes, they're on, you know, God knows what. But this letter is to a journalist, Craig McGregor, mm -hmm. um, who wrote an article basically saying that the Beatles were imitating and exploiting black music. And John, on a flight, which is why he's got American Airlines stationery, sat down and wrote a letter saying, you know, and this is this handwritten letter here in the book, you know, it was not exploiting black music. We always said when it was black music, this was the stuff that we loved. And this is the stuff that we learned everything from. We always acknowledge that. And it, that's why it's the stuff that we did, you know, and what John didn't say in this that I, you know, maybe he didn't even know was that when the Beatles played Please Mr. Postman on the BBC, it was the first time any Tamla Motown song had been played on the BBC. And that was the Beatles very first appearance before they were even signed. He so, probably didn't know that. I'm he sure probably he probably didn't. Know. You know, he probably didn't. But, uh, you know, it's... It, it, it's interesting that, you know, he took this up. I mean, he he, he didn't write angrily. He, he mm -hmm. just wrote informatively, you know, a two-page letter about it. But, you know, that, that letter is placed right after they talk about the song It's So Hard. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring that up is because John, on this one page, he, he talks about his love for, for black music and black artists mm -hmm. and his love for blues as well. And and how that led to his love for early R and B, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Bo Diddley, and what what I found really interesting about that letter, Alan, was that he said that he wishes that the Beatles covers of those songs that were done by black artists were truer to the originals, that mm -hmm. they were closer to the way they were done mm -hmm. instead of the way the Beatles did them. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the "It's So Hard" section that you just referred to they have a little photo of a section of his jukebox and you know it's all black artists mm -hmm. it's all r&b stuff and little eva and you know what, uh, all kinds of other stuff so and also yeah one of the things that i eat up whenever i i see this kind of stuff i do love handwritten lyrics yeah. and sometimes you'll notice that john will scratch out a certain line and replace it with something else here sometimes you can't make out what he's writing <laughs> right. and uh it, it's a little frustrating but you know just um to mention a few things for it's so hard the title of it originally was sometimes i feel like going down mm -hmm. um there was an extra line in there on oh my love i hear the rain oh i hear the grass there's some other extra lines in oh my love but i can't make out john's handwriting there mm -hmm. but that kind of stuff i really find fascinating and mm -hmm. um he also talked about how, which, as I've said, has emerged as one of my favorite of all of John's solo songs. And he, he does say in there that it's George's favorite song. Hmm. And I, you know, you don't hear all that much about how the Beatles feel about each other's solo works. You know, there's a little bit here and there. I remember George Harrison saying that he liked that would be something from the first McCartney album. But I never knew this about how. But this is coming from John. And John also said that George really liked the strings on It's So Hard. I just love, you know, learning little tidbits like that. Oh, Yoko, there was a verse, In the Middle of the Sea, which he didn't use. Right. Mm -hmm. So little things like that that you pick up just from reading the handwritten lyrics. But, you know, you, we were talking about all the people that went to Tittenhurst Park or worked there. They even have, believe it or not, the guy that you see in the Imagine film 
It was also in, I believe, Imagine John Lennon, the guy that was hanging around the grounds there that walked up and talked right. to John Claudio. Wow. Claudio, his name was... His name was... But you, you yeah. learn the story about him because he was a Vietnam veteran. Right. And he was just released from the hospital in San Francisco, and he sent John telegrams. Right. Believing that the songs that he was writing were directed to him. And the book includes the, some of the telegrams, I think. It includes the, the one about you know getting getting a ride from Gatwick uh-huh yeah it's just a, it's a fascinating book i mean anything you'd ever want to learn about any of the people involved with imagine but you know i also wanted to say it's more than just that it's more about the story well i shouldn't say more about but it's the complete story of john and yoko because there are quotes there from john and from yoko talking about how they got together first right. what their relationship was like what followed after john's death what Yoko has been doing to carry on to promote John's work and keep his name out there. So there's all of that in there. For me, I always find John as an artist in the studio to be the most fascinating thing. And one of the things that you talk about contradiction here, many of the musicians that were involved with Imagine have all said the same thing in this book, which is that John knew what he wanted yeah. when he was recording in the studio for his songs which contradicts what we heard from the Beatle years <laughs> from people like George Martin and Jeff Emmerich that Paul was the one that always knew exactly what he, what he wanted and could articulate it well John was a struggle because he couldn't always say exactly what he wanted but here with Imagine these musicians feel the exact opposite way mm -hmm. and John also liked to work quickly which we know about Right, but as I was talking to Alan privately about this, in the last few weeks I've been listening to a few bootlegs of John's solo work, and he'll do a song like Whatever Gets You Through the Night, and this is before Elton John got involved, and there's like 25 takes of this song. And same thing with the song Love from Plastic Ono Band. He's working on it on acoustic guitar, and he's doing take after take after take, and I'm thinking, this is supposed to be about someone that likes to work quickly, and yet he's willing to work hard till he finds the arrangement that he wants. So many times throughout this book on Imagine, you'll hear John say, or the, the musician say, that the album was done in a week, which really is quickly. Mm -hmm. But he'd work hard on every song till he got it right. So he wouldn't mind spending hours working on a song, take after take, until it was done right. Right. And that's why it was done quickly, even though he worked very hard on it. Yeah, and though the, they still had limited time in the studio because the studio wasn't finished. So, you know, he was, I think, driving them pretty hard and, uh, you know, probably had time for fewer takes than the, the two instances that, that you mentioned from, from other sessions. Yeah, you know, it doesn't give uh, how many, you know, takes of everything were, were done here. I suppose if we were, were to look for something to complain about in terms of discographical information... It doesn't give that, but um, you know, this is this book. I, I I found it really incredible, and and I had no idea what to expect. But I also kind of feel that you know, another another thing about this. When I heard about all of these reissues when they were first announced, I thought, well, you know, I mean, imagine, haven't we? Like, don't we all know enough about Imagine? <laughs> you know, it's mm. it's his most popular album, and um, you know, we've heard it almost to death. And I was almost like, not not looking forward to hearing it, but it was sort of like I I didn't expect to be surprised in any way. But this combination of releases, the book, the DVD, Blu-ray, and the box set is like completely the way to do a reissue of a historic album because now you you know i have a completely new appreciation for the album and you know the the book tells you sort of everything you need to know about the album and the film and all together it's just an incredible uh, you know i'd say package but it wasn't a package it's three separate things mm. you know, probably should yeah. be a package <laughs> Well, We're going to you, come up with another big five hundred dollar box set then. Yeah, right. <laughs> They'll add a disc of uh, the something. book, the Blu-ray, the box set. 
uh, and a polka dot vinyl pressing will be the unique uh, item. I'm li- I'm just my mouth's watering listening to the two of you uh, talk about the book. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to I'm be the la- la- last one on the block, but better late than never. Yeah, I just want to add that, um, you know, in our last show, we were thinking about the possibility that maybe this is a sign of things to come if Yoko wants to work on John's other solo albums this way. And um, the sad thing is that in the case of Imagine, we're very fortunate that we have film footage of the rehearsals for that kind of thing, plus the Imagine video album as well. If you were to go through the other solo albums, yeah, you can show the videos for the singles. I don't know how much footage there is at all. I mean, say of mind game sessions or walls and bridges. And it adds so much to the full picture when you do see that kind of thing. So we will probably, if this does uh, come to fruition, that that we get other solo albums from John treated like this, it will have to be strictly the audio, which will take any day. (laughs) (laughs) But um, it would be nice if... if, um, you know, the other albums were treated like this and uh, everything was filmed. But that's just not the way that, that things were done. Now, maybe we'll be also surprised and unaware of uh, some footage that was never used uh, or never released or lost. Uh, but, you know, in the case of uh, Mind Games and Imagine, I'm sure that there will be enough outtakes and alternate versions and demos that, you know, that we will be in seventh heaven with those alone. And uh, you're, thinking of, you're thinking of walls and bridges. Yeah. What did I say? Imagine, Imagine. <laughs> uh, walls and bridges and mind games. Yeah. That, I mean, there's gotta be, you know, a treasure trove of, uh, of, of, of outtakes and whatnot. Uh, so perhaps, uh, you know, like, like we mentioned last week that this Imagine releases the first in a series. Which could make 2019 an equally expensive year like 2018 is turning out because you got Abbey Road's 50th anniversary, Let It Be's 50th anniversary, and if Yoko's going to keep going with uh, Lennon releases, and I'm still waiting for the day when Ringo's back catalog gets overhauled because you know that's happening at some point. Do you think there'll ever come a day when George's solo catalog will be given a treatment like this? Uh, Honestly, right now, I'd say no, because um, I interviewed Danny Harrison when his solo, a recent solo album came out. Uh, so this is about a year ago. And I, I kind of asked him, is there anything possibly percolating there in his dad's archives? And it, the answer I got was sort of like, no, they're finished. Are they finished forever? Are they finished for now? Is he just not, does he not want to? Uh, give off any hints at projects that might come in 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 the, the next few years. I don't know, but taking his words literal, it sounded like they've done and released what they plan on doing for George. So I, I have a feeling it's going to be quiet on the George front for a little while. You know. Hmm. Well, all we can do is is hope that we'll get. So when they released no, Early Takes uh, Volume 1, they were just messing with us. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, when I, when I interviewed Danny, I, I felt, you know, last year that I didn't want to overdo it mm-hmm. with being being the fan, asking him all these questions. You know, I knew he was there to promote his, his, his new solo album, you know, because that was another one of the ones. What was the plan? There had to be a plan in place for you to release early takes with a volume one in the title and why has there not been any further volumes or is this possibly going to be something that's going to pop up in five years you know for some some other future anniversary maybe they don't even have their plans completely fleshed out but you know you're taking his words at face value it sounds like they're done for now you know, By the way, I remember Giles Martin giving an interview several years ago where he hinted that he was asked to comb through George's archives, indicating mm. that there would be further work on that. So, who knows? Never say never. Yeah, they probably don't want to reveal too much and, you know, because plans change. Like, 
all the talk about let the let it be movie coming out we all were, were waiting thinking it was right around the corner and we were practically told oh it's right around the corner and now how many years have gone since we first believed we were getting let it be on dv w- w- was blu-ray even out at that time no you know when we were hearing that when let it be naked came out and the film's right around the corner and it never happened to now yeah and they were saying yeah. that even longer ago than that i mean but in 1995 before the anthology was finished they had said that they uh had a version of let it be that that they were you know working on i don't know if it was totally ready yet but let it be in shea stadium were two projects that right they had just put on the shelf maybe somebody Mm -hmm. uh within apple you know you could even go back further than that i just remembered when leave my kitten alone was supposed to come out as a single in the early 80s and then all of a sudden you never heard it mentioned again maybe somebody internally is like how about we all just zip it you know because what ends up happening we get the end you know the people begin peppering us with no pun intended with questions uh, about these releases and we've kind of changed our minds on certain things and it's not going to happen or so now we're just left in the dark today you know maybe the let it too much too much possible possibility too many possibilities about let it be leaked and they ended up changing their mind on it and now they have this whole thing that keeps this debate that keeps going on and on why aren't they releasing should they release so let's just kind of like zip it and not leak anything else out um (laughs) somebody did try to get giles at the white album listening uh media event that was held a few weeks back that ken and i were both at and we'll be talking about all of this what in the next couple of weeks with the white album but last year of course when soldier pepper came out Probably, I would think, accidentally, Giles let the cat out of the bag about there being a White Album set coming next year. You know, so, of course, somebody wanted to try to poke any bit of information about Abbey Road, probably, coming next year. Is that going to be a possibility? And Giles very cleverly dodged the question and moved up and changed the topic. Well, you know Uh, something, Darren? You know, not to throw a monkey wrench in screw up everyone's heads right now which this will probably do but um (laughs) the fact that paul just recently mentioned that they're planning on re-editing or they're working on re-editing let it be i mean he let that slip out and maybe just maybe and i have nothing no information to even confirm this i mean we're we would naturally think abbey road is next maybe it's let it be I mean, in terms of recording, Let It Be would be next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we don't know. (laughs) Tune in next time to Things We Said Today. (laughs) And we will scratch our heads even more with you. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, Paul wouldn't just say something like that unless he knows what he's doing. When he gives information like that out there, he knows it's going to get publicity. So, you know, he's getting people to think about that. But no one's saying anything about Abbey Road. Granted, that's that's a year from now. If there's going to be whatever the next release is, so. But um, Paul talked about Let It Be, but Paul didn't was bring trying, up Abbey Road. What Paul was trying to do was deflect attention away from the price tag of the new box set, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so people aren't paying very close attention to what they're paying for the Red Rose Speedway and Wildlife sets. Mm. You have them all figured out, Darren. Uh, I wish that was the case. <laughs> all right, I think we covered everything. Any final thoughts at all on any of this, all the Lennon stuff? No, I think w- w- nobody could have summed up all things imagined better than we did over the past two shows. Yeah, I mean, I really think Yoko deserves a lot of credit because you couldn't ask for more than what she just gave, unless, as I said in our last show, every outtake was released. But uh, she gave us so much, and and everything was so well done. And, you know, whether it's the box set, whether it's the DVD Blu-ray, or this book, I mean, I now, because of what Alan said, I now want to go back and watch the DVD, thinking about all the people that I'm learning more about from the book. 
mm-hmm. and seeing their photos and identifying with them. So, um, you know, you're getting as close as you could possibly be to these sessions. And um, I, I remember saying many years ago, nobody's life is a total open book, but John's is as close as you can get. And much of that is through the work of Yoko, which we should be very grateful for. Mm-hmm. All right. So with that, uh, let's give out our contact information, starting with you, Alan. Easiest way to get me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay, and how about our contact information for the show? Well, our contact information for the show is you can email us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at at sign things we said fab and we have a Facebook page which is things we said today Beatles radio fans all righty Darren how about you my Facebook page for uh, my uh, my radio broadcasting Facebook page is Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio. That's where I'd love for you to come by and like the page. You can email me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. Uh, WFUV's website, if you'd like to check out what WFUV is all about is uh, WFUV.org, and you can listen, uh, you can stream. If you're not in the New York City metropolitan area and you want to hear the station, you want to hear me, um, you can catch me uh, on WFUV Monday through Thursday night starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. On Also on Sunday night slash Monday mornings at midnight till 2 a.m. Monday morning. And we also have a secondary channel which you can stream or listen to on the app, and that is uh, something that I refer to as FUV music, and it's on the weekends, and it uh, it used to be our HD2 channel. It's a long story. It isn't anymore, but you can hear me Saturday starting at 12 noon for 36 consecutive hours till midnight Sunday night on WFUV.org and the app, the WFUV app, and that's the FUV music stream. Did you say 36 consecutive hours? Yes. 12 noon Saturday to midnight Sunday night. Go to uh, the FUV Music stream on our website or app, and I'll be there. And there's more Darren than, my goodness, anyone <laughs> really needs. <laughs> Get as much a uh, dose of Darren as you need right there. Um, boy, am I hoarse at the end of that 36 hours. <laughs> Okay, as for me, Ken Michaels, uh, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. You can email me at everylittlething at att.net. I often mention my website because in addition to all the interviews that I do with uh, people in the Beatle world, I do have Beatles trivia that I post every single week, which runs from Monday through Sunday. You can win one of nine great prizes every single week, including Egypt Station and the two-CD version of the uh, new Imagine collection. And every now and then I have a special contest on my website. And we're right now in the midst of one. By the time you hear this, it'll be too late to enter. But I was giving away the uh, two LP version of Imagine. But I will tell you folks that I will start either this Friday, which is October 26th, or next Monday, the 29th, The very book that we've been talking about, Imagine John Yoko. I have only one copy to give away. It's courtesy of Grand Central Publishing. It's a wonderful book, and you can win it in a special contest. All the details are right there on the home page of my website, which leads you to the special contest page of my website. So make sure you check it out. It's KenMichaelsRadio.com. Also remember that... um, my solo Beatles video cast, Talk More Talk, is every two weeks like this show. It's on the Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Tuesday nights usually starts either 9 or 10 o'clock Eastern. You can join me, Kid O'Toole, Ken Womack, and Tom Hunyadi for that show. Okay, so that about covers everything, I think. Wait, Ken? Ken? Yeah? Ken, am I eligible to win the book from uh, your contest? Um, uh, uh, under Probably. a different name, a different name. Oh, okay. I've got a few different names that people call me I can use. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, what about uh, something like Darren Ramon or yeah. something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a couple of other things, um, apart from the fact that I'm going to be at the International White Album Symposium in Monmouth, New Jersey. We all are. We are yes. doing a panel on Saturday at one thirty, And then after our panel, I'm on another one at 3 o'clock on Saturday with the Swinging Through the 60s podcast guys, which are Richard Buskin and Eric Taros. And often we do it with Craig Bartok, who's a guitarist in heart, but he can't make it. So we got someone to stand in, and that is Mark Lewison. Um, so... That show actually will be recording live for subsequent podcast, and uh, it will be about the comparing John's White Album to Paul's White Album. In other words, the stuff each of them contributed. Okay, I'm doing also one on Friday night, and my solo appearance will be Sunday talking about the John Lennon Revolution trilogy. Also, if anyone happens to be up in Maine, this coming weekend, as we're speaking, on October 27th, there is an art center in Bath, Maine, along the coast, uh, called the Chocolate Church, and they are having a Beatles poetry slam. And I'm going to be one of, I think, 16 readers reading one of the Beatles poems. It's also apparently competitive and part of it is audience reaction. And since I'm probably not going to be bringing many people with me, you should all come up to Maine and react. Um, <laughs> but I am having a house guest that weekend, a uh, certain Mr. Lewison, who will be coming with me and will also be appearing as a reader on this poetry slam. And, uh, so really, you definitely want to hightail it up here and come to this. It's the Chocolate Church in Bath, Maine, October 27th. Um, I'm not sure what time it starts, but if you get there at 6, you'll probably manage to get in. Do you, uh, is it, does it get physical? I mean, do, should people bring weapons or? No, not even jelly beans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to mention that. <laughs> Can you tell us what you'll be reading? I will be doing Across the Universe, and Mark will be doing A Hard Day's Night. Okay. Just for that alone, everyone should flock to Maine. <laughs> Absolutely. And I should also add that you can join me and the Talk More Talk crew, as we'll be doing our own panel Sunday morning at 10.30. You can join me, Kid O'Toole, Ken Womack and Tom Hunyadi, and if you need more information about the symposium, just go to monmouth.edu, M-O-N-M-O-U-T-H dot E-D-U. All right, then. This has been so much fun taking a look at all the Imagine releases over the last two shows. And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for joining us. And we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.